this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your half hour or so of special guests and special topics that are designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. Today with me, my special guest is Barry LaBeouf, who is a marketing genius and expert, and he's written a book called The Power of Differentiation. Welcome, Barry. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Wayne. I'm really excited to be on the show. I love all of your shows. I've listened for a long time. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We're, we're trying to expand from local to national. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but the one thing that I can't say that I am that you are is you were a rock star in the 1980s. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Well, I wouldn't call myself a rock star. My songs did sell well under one million copies. Wait. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I had songs uh, that were on American Bandstand. We had a video that was on MTV and HBO Jukebox. I've written hundreds and hundreds of songs. And uh, I got to work in bands. I got to meet a lot of people, backed up John Mellon camping at concerts. You know, so I got to see a lot of things. And what's really interesting, Wayne, it all comes it all really does compare to what we do in business. You're dealing with people, you deal with talent, you work with difficult people, you work with wonderful people, and you got to coach them and get them really to perform well. What was the name of the band? Well, originally it was LaBeouf and Beyond. But <laughs> my band members did not like uh, my name in there. So we uh, one day a very famous rock producer called me on the phone and he said, look, um, actually, he interrupted the operator. It's one of those things you're on the phone and the operator comes on. So I thought, oh, my gosh, somebody's, you know, in trouble or whatever. Anyway, he gets on. He says, look, kid, your music is great. It's amazing. Put it all in an envelope and mark urgent on it. And I said, OK. He said, mark urgent. I said, OK. So I put in an envelope. I put urgent on it. And we mailed it out. And I thought, you know, what a great name for a band, Mark Urgent. So that's what we named it after we got rid of LaBeouf and beyond, because we didn't want to name it after a guy. And then we actually came up with a name that sounds like a guy or uh, some kind of, um, you know, espionage, you know, spy or something. So that's, that's cool. what it was called. I think it's Mark. cool. And what was hey, the song that got featured? Um, it was On a Night Like This. On a Night it's Like on This. It's on Spotify. It's on Tidal. It's on, you know, all the music services so outstanding uh, well yeah it, it was fun it was a great experience as a quasi musician myself I, I absolutely love this story so you know it got me really into the book and then he used a lot of analogies the power of differentiation what is this book about tell us what the the main gist of the book is main gist of the book is very basic and that is differentiation of your brand and or your products can certainly lead to increasing sales and market share. But what's even more important, it can help you as a business leader win over the hearts and minds of your employees. And that's what's so critical. Today, we need significance. We need to think we're doing something of some worth, some meaning. And when you can differentiate, and, and Wayne, we may talk about this, it doesn't mean you're superior. It means you're different. You're unique in a specific way, and there's a reason. When you can do that, it gives meaning to the people who are putting your product together or serving your clients. Give me an example of how you can use branding to engage your employees and to really get them to buy in and share in the, in the experience. I'll give you an example. We, uh, we met with a company, a very brilliant engineering company, and I asked them about a particular product they created, and it was it was a, a lid. It was a manhole cover, really, for a tanker trailer. So, uh, and I said, so what's, what's important about it? And he said, well, you know, it costs us millions of dollars. We engineered it, uh, and it has a special latch that we designed that uh, will enable it to uh, activate in case there's high pressure. And I said, so what's that mean? He said, well, it means it saves lives. Somebody climbs up, tries to open it up. If there's too much pressure, it will not release. I said, wow. I said, do you charge more? He said, no. I said, do you share this information with your employees? He says, well, no, it's just what we ought to do. I said, uh, do you market it? He goes, no. I said, well, what do you call this thing? And he said, latch. <laughs> and I said, you know, if you name it and you tell the reason behind this, why you did it, why you work night after night to create this, to help save lives, not only may you end up selling it at a premium, 
but maybe your employees will have a, a point of pride. They'll, they'll go, wow, I'm doing something to actually save lives. That's an example. With, you're doing the great thing. See, I don't, I don't create somebody's brand. I discover it. It's something you're already doing. So and what did we, you change the name to? Um, it, it's, a, it's a proprietary name. I'm not okay. supposed to go into it. But, um, but you know, it went from just plain old latch to something that they've, they've created. They got so, everybody excited about. Yeah. Well, it's a point of pride. Um, one other example, I, I was in a factory that was building ambulances and I talked to one of the young people there that was on the plant floor. And I said, what do you do? And he goes, I plug in wire harnesses. I said, okay. And he said, I'm about to leave and go down the street to a marshmallow factory for 25 cents more an hour. I said, okay, well, every one of these ambulances going down the line last about 10 years. He goes, yeah. And I said, they save or protect 100,000 people each during their lifetime. And he stopped and he said, I never thought I was in the life-saving business. I said, maybe you are. Maybe it's important to plug that harness in right. Maybe you're making a difference. And he said, well, I'm making a lot more difference than just, you know, going to a marshmallow factory. Now, Wayne, he, he stayed. I don't know. Marshmallows are pretty good. They are pretty good. He <laughs> stayed, but you know what? He have stayed for $2 more an hour uh, at the other place. But again, that's what it is. Your brand has to have a meaning. You've got to feel you're doing something of value. And it, it really helps internally and externally. Excellent. I mean, I, I really, really like that. In fact, uh, we used that idea to create a brand for our exit planning. It's called Aspire to Exit. Um, and I, th I think it, I did it intuitively, but you're doing it consciously, intentionally with your clients. And you've been doing it for how long? 41 years or more? 41 years. But Wayne, what you offer is so important because a person who merely sells that company that they've been toiling over for 30 years, they just sell it for basically the minimum, is missing out, like you said, if they don't identify a few of those unique things they offer that nobody else does or few can do. That makes them a more valuable company to the person who then buys it. This leads me to a section of the book that talks about the commodity monster, commodity. Um, everybody does the same thing. You, how do you differentiate yourself? Tell us about what the commodity monster is in your mind and, and how to beat it. You know, the commodity monster is something we, we, we called or we named because so often we had run into clients that said, hey, we're going to kind of uh, decontent is a term, meaning we're going to take some of the cool features out of our product. We're going to cheapen it so that it can compete against cheaper products out there. We run into that. We run into some private equity companies that buy a, a business and they go, you know, this company, now that we bought them, we're going to really streamline their operations. And a lot of times that's great, but sometimes they take the most unique features out just to make it easier to manufacture or sell. The commodity monster, as we call it, wants you to do that. They want you to dumb everything you do down to the minimum. They want you to take your personality out of it, and they want to make it just exactly like everyone else so that procurement can come in and beat you up. And so we work with companies, and we, we talk to them on this, and we really – cheerlead them into keeping some of that uniqueness that they have. The thing that you bought that product for 10 years ago, you want that with that product today. Wow. That is such a great lesson to take out to everybody. And, you know, the readers of this book are really going to benefit from that. I, I think, you know, I, you can apply it in services businesses. You can apply it in law firms, you know, whatever. The, if you do something that's a little bit extra, that differentiates yourself and your company from what others are doing, maybe it is worth more. And maybe it is worth more to spend for that little bit extra, whatever it is, whether it's service or luxury or whatever. You're absolutely right. I was speaking to a 120-year-old bakery and their leadership group. And I said, what do you do that's unique? And they said, absolutely nothing. We're like everyone else. We just make the same old stuff. So what you just said, Wayne, is brilliant because you said something that's a secret to how you can determine sometimes what makes you unique. And that I, so I asked what you just alluded to. I said, okay, is there anything you pay more money 
for, any ingredient, anything. And their purchasing person said, oh, yeah, well, we have a certain kind of grain that costs us much more than we really need to pay, but it has the best taste and nobody else in the market has it. I said, great. So you, you pay more and you, you have it in that product of yours. Do you call that out? And he said, no. I said, it's a lost opportunity. That's a differentiator. There's a reason you did this. You're paying extra. Now capitalize on it. And by the way, like you said earlier, let's share that with our employees and say, hey, we do this because we think it tastes better. Great lessons. Great lessons in marketing and, and branding. Um, in the book, we talk about Virgil and his best kept secret. Tell us that story, would you? Virgil Miller uh, was a uh, religious, spiritual mentor of mine. He, he was an Amish man. He's passed away. He, so he's an Amish man who ran an RV company, which sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? <laughs> uh, but it's not. They actually built RVs, wonderful company named Newmar. In our first discussion, Wayne, he said to me, I, I want to let you know we're very proud of something. I said, what's that? He said, we feel we're the best kept secret in the RV industry. And I said, I got to tell you, Virgil, if we work together and it's a year from now and you're still the best kept secret, you need to fire my company because you don't want to be a best kept secret. And he said, well, we're humble and, you know, we're Amish men and Amish women and we don't think it's right to brag. And I said, it's not bragging if it's the truth. Now, it's bragging if you say we're better looking and we're fun people. Oh, yeah, OK. But if you have a better product. And you're putting extra into it and extra craftsmanship. You need to share that. And again, part of it was you need to share it with your employees. And he said, you know, we never share that with our employees. And he said, I bet they'd be proud. So that's what you don't want to be a best kept secret. It's it's it, if you catch yourself doing it, then you got to kick yourself and say, OK, hold on. I got to let people know what we do. Well, I, I respect Virgil for his humility. And I think it's a great characteristic of a leader. Um, wouldn't it be great if we had more leaders like that in this country, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but you're absolutely right. If he wants to grow his company for his family, for his employees, for the people that he services and for his customers, he doesn't want to keep it a best kept secret. He wants to be out there. So how did you convince him to change that? Did that, was that able, were you able to, to get him to turn around and say, oh, I think you're right. Let's. Let's I'll follow your lead on this. Yeah, it did. It did work out. And he was happy to do it because he realized that it was the truth, number one. And number two, it was a point of pride for his employees. And I would say also, number three, it meant he was listening to customers and that he cared. And I said, you know, doing all those things is something that people feel good about. That's why they turn to you. And and he got it. He he just he just needed somebody to see some of the unique things they were doing. W were you able to share that branding? Are you able to share the branding, rebranding with us today? Are you, wh what, what did you do or what, how did you convince him to do something different that unleashed the uh, secret or opened up the, the secret book? Well, I'll tell you one thing we did that might be a, a kind of a strange but unique uh, example was when he and I were talking, their new leadership group had decided to um, changed the way they were manufacturing and to go to more of a uh, of an approach to mass market their products because they were up against more mass marketed uh, heavily, uh, uh, you know, I would say large, largely distributed companies. And we were able to convince him after they tried that for a few months and they found out they lost a lot of customers. We were able to convince him to, to understand that his level of customization in each one of his products was unmatched. And at first they didn't really believe it, but they saw the market share go down and they had to stop that program and go right back to being a highly customized coach. But here, Wayne, is where it got great. So for all of your business listeners, here's what got great. They went back to customization, drum roll, and charged more for it because they realized that's what customers want. Up to then, they were not charging like they should have for all that extra work. I'm learning a lot today. And I'm <laughs> learning that I think I need to do the same thing that you told Virgil to do. 
Mm -hmm. um, less less uh, commoditization, more customization if you have something to customize, obviously. Now, the book also ex uh, explores some of your coaching experiences, you know, for your kids. Your kids are good athletes. Um, tell us a little bit about your, I think it was your daughter that was playing basketball. Is that right? And then your son who was doing all these trick shots. Tell us a little bit about that and how that wraps into the power of differentiation and marketing. Well, that I, I appreciate you, you bringing that up. Here's an example, and this affected me in um, our process. We have a process called brand re-engineering. So when we come in, we, we'll look at a, a company, we'll talk to people there, we'll also go into their, their, their physical building or plant, and we'll learn what makes them unique. And we'll discover things that they should not change, as well as things that really make them great. Um, and a lot of times we'll run into a company that is trying to be something that it really isn't. It's trying to be, you know, the low cost leader when it's really not things like that. So mm -hmm. one day uh, I was sitting in the stands before I was coaching my daughter. I was watching her. She was a five year old girl and she runs down in front of us, you know, down the court with her girlfriends. And I yelled out, I said, hey, take your hands out of your pockets. <laughs> Well, the people next to me thought I was joking. Oh, you're such a jokester. You know, I said, no, no, that's my daughter. Her hands are in her pockets. She can't hold a ball if they're in her pockets. So I talked to her about that. And over the time, I got to coach her a lot after that and all. And one day she said to me, she said, Dad, you know, I, I don't know if I want to play basketball. I, I, don't, I don't love it. And I said, wait a minute, you know, you're a foot taller than the rest of the girls. And we live in Indiana. You've got to play basketball. <laughs> and she said, no, dad, I, I want to do art. I want to do creative. OK, so everybody listening, I'm not talking about a personal experience. I'm talking about your brand and your company, because here's here's what the learning experience was. It occurred to me that, yes, she was taller. Yes, I could try to manufacture her into a basketball player. But you know what? She'd end up like a lot of those young kids who are miserable. They, they get a good scholarship. They hate their father for it or their mother. They drop out of school and everyone goes, boy, she could have been good, but she wasn't. Well, it's because she didn't love that. That wasn't what really made her excited. And it wasn't really what was different about her. So I realized right then I thought, you know, she has the ability to get close if I have to push her and turn her into something that she can't deal with very well, or I can allow her to be what she is at her best. And that's how we have to look at our businesses. Could I lower, could you lower your rates? Yes. Could you uh, add staff and do things cheaper and try to compete with the cheap shop down the street? Yes. Would you thrive? No. Would you be able to give the personal service you give to your clients? No. Okay. Well, then your good clients are leaving you and you've lowered your price. So again, it was the same situation. Um, you look at what you do best and then you really magnify it. That's the magic you have. So that, that's how I worked with my, my daughter. The one thing I would add regarding my son that fits to one of the things we recommend to every client when we work with them. Um, so we'll go through the process and we will end up learning what they need to do, what they need to hold on and never change as well as here's some things maybe you need to identify and name uh, that are these unique differentiators. We, here are things you need to really promote. But before it is launched to the world, and so before our clients with their new brand, their new branding, will go tell their customers or put ads in their magazines or on, on online, we require them best we can to celebrate it internally with their employees first. The employees must hear, here's what we're doing. You, you contributed to this. This is a celebration of the great things you did. This is where we're going. So that moving forward, the employees have a sense of pride. I did that with my son's baseball teams when he was 10 years old. At the end of every season, we had an award ceremony, but it was not one of those participation awards things. It was, you know, here's Wayne. Well, what's Wayne do great? Wayne's got the fastest arm on the team. So he's, you know, quick draw Wayne. Okay, here's so-and-so. What does she do? Oh, she's the fastest girl on the team. Okay, she's speedy, you know, whatever. And the whole point was everybody celebrated their strengths. 
and and by the way, I had a lot of losing teams. Uh, <laughs> not, not state champions at all. But but we also had another problem because we treated kids so well. We had too much. We had too high of retention. The kids never wanted to leave. So if they were with us one year, they would never leave. And um, so it's time that's, to move on. Yeah. that's how we connected it. It's you share the good news and the positives with your employees first. And I think having a positive attitude about not just branding and marketing, but your business generally is, is uh, it's viral. You know, people will, will catch on and they'll catch on to your passion if you're the leader. But I love the idea of sharing it with the employees and making them own it first. Uh, not making them own it, but allowing them to own it because they're the ones that really contributed to the creation of, of the success that you're now taking out to the public. And I think that's a great idea, great way of looking at it. I have a question for you. Do you find when you're working with your clients and they're looking to do a succession plan or they're, they're going to exit, have you ever looked at the company and said, you know, you got to realize there's a lot more to this company or a lot more value. Have you run into that very much? Yesterday. <laughs> All the time. Entrepreneurs yeah. are so focused on making the business work and making it better. Uh, I had this one guy in yesterday and it was, it's an old client, estate planning client of mine, but we're doing the exit planning for them. And I said, what are your goals? I, he said, look, I just successfully turned around the business. We were really having a hard time. And it took us seven years to turn this thing around. I can't think about the, the future. I can't think about the exit. I said, don't you want to grow this thing? You, if you were successful in turning it around, don't you want to make this into something that's even greater than it is today? And it's a pretty big company. And his comment was, you know, I hadn't thought about it like that. I think I better start thinking about it like that. It's called planning, you know, and planning for growth. And exactly. Yeah. That, to answer your question, yes, it happens all the time. And uh, we want to have people thinking ahead and thinking about the inevitable and the unexpected, but also planning for what they want to have happen and, and really getting excited about it so that everybody else around them will get excited instead of just sort of, you know, day by day, we'll come in and do our job and then go home at five. That That's not a lot of fun. So, um the power of differentiation. When is the book officially out? It's officially out the end of February, but I'm I'm sharing the word now. One of my goals, I want the book to touch and move the hearts of a quarter million people. And and that may sound large to some, but remember, some companies have 15,000 employees. And if one leader in that company can say, wait a minute, let's really help people understand what we're doing has significance and there's a difference to what we do and why there's that's 15,000 people. So I'm trying to spread that word because I'm inspired to achieve that goal. A quarter of a million people moved and uh, excited about what they do. Why a quarter of a million? I just pulled it out of my head. It was bigger. <laughs> the first number was a hundred thousand. And I thought, now nah, let's go, to, let's do a quarter of a million. You know, I really like that. I'm going to steal it from you and I'm going to try to do the same. I, I, one, of, uh, one of the guys that uh, is a client of mine, he's a friend of mine, wrote a book on transparency. It's a very good book. And uh, his, 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 you know, his idea, his goal was to have a, a million people, a million people not read the book necessarily, but be moved by the message in the book. How do you measure that? How are you going to measure the 250? You know, it's going to be an estimate. It's a creative process, but <laughs> it's an inspiring process. We've already moved 100,000 people if I look at all the clients we've worked with. But, you know, I want to do that. I, th that's a differentiation for me. You know, if I can think that, hey, what I'm doing, it's not just selling books. It's, it's like, hey, wait a minute. We can actually move, you know, a city worth of people. So, I, you know. Hey, I'd like to be wrong and move millions with with the message from the book. And like you said, Wayne, you're right on target. It doesn't have to be a, a quarter of a million people reading it. It's a quarter of a million people affected by that positive, meaningful message. And it's it's a message that you can use in business and you can use in your personal lives. 
And I thank you. So Barry, how can people get in touch with you if they want to follow up with you and have you and your team help them with their branding and their message? Wayne, thank you very much. And I want to compliment you. Uh, your book is fantastic and, and you are the best in the business at what you do. So I'm, I'm honored to be on the program today. So uh, the basic thing is my name is Barry LaBove and LaBove is L-A-B as in boy, O-V as in Victor. So there's a BarryLaBove.com website. There's a LaBove.com. Either way, go to BarryLaBove.com. And uh, you can click on there and set up an appointment and we'll talk for 15 minutes or so. I'm not charging on that. I'm just talking to people. So people call me up and we have a good time. So it's as simple as that. I love that. And I, and making yourself available to all of these people is an extraordinary gift and a generous offer. And we thank you for being on Blueprint for Wealth today, too. Thank you, Wayne. It's been an honor. And thanks for listening to Blueprint for Wealth and stay tuned for another special topic after this, but also stay tuned for our special guest next time on Blueprint for Wealth. Have a great week.